Do you want to run faster? And this video is for you. What's up guys, Cody Bidlow with AthleteX coming at you with another video. Today we're going to be talking about speed workouts for sprinters, going over what constitutes a speed workout, how you can break up speed training into different categories, and how you can implement this into your training program. While you're here, please subscribe so you can get notified of my future videos, hit a thumbs up so YouTube knows it's a good video to show to others, and leave a comment if you have any questions. The goal of speed training is obvious, or at least it should be, in that the primary goal is to increase the maximal velocity at which you are able to sprint. People will use the term speed training to talk about a lot of things that don't constitute anything that leads to maximal velocity training. This could be using speed agility ladders, this could be using some banded exercises, this could be any number of things. But in reality, the only way you really get faster is by running as fast as possible and then trying to over time progress the loading, improve your technique, and then use other secondary means such as strength and conditioning training, plyometric training, other types of training to then push the level at which you can sprint up in a less direct and secondary manner. But when it comes to doing something that can directly lead to you running faster, sprint training at maximal velocity is really the only way to do it. There's a few main goals of speed training. First, to progressively increase rhythm, tempo, and frequency throughout the run. So as you go through the run, the rhythm at which you're running, the tempo or the frequency, your stride frequency, should increase throughout the duration of the run. If your stride frequency decreases at any point, you're probably not running any faster. So if you really want to work on speed, then you need to focus on that progressive increase in the frequency at which you are hitting the ground and focus on consistently increasing that frequency throughout the run. The next goal is that we also want to progressively raise the posture of the athlete throughout the run as well. While you do start out at an angle when you sprint, eventually you're gonna to get to an upright position. To run as fast as possible, you need to be very comfortable in upright sprinting. You need to focus on having your whole posture in line so that say you're accelerating, you don't want your head to be bent down because that's gonna force your back to come up in order to correct and maintain the same center of mass. If you want to strike the ground effectively, if you want to do it without feeling like you're fighting against yourself, then you need to make sure that your posture is in line. When your posture is in line, it's going to be a lot easier for your brain to organize your limbs, set your body up, strike the ground in a way that's effective, and ultimately run as fast as possible. So you want to make sure that your posture is in line and that you're progressively rising throughout the run. If you get to 40 meters and your head's down, your torso's forward, and your legs are behind you, you're probably not in a good position to run as fast as possible. Therefore, we want to eventually achieve that upright sprinting position, keep your head up so you can see the finish line, and strike down and back, down and back, down and back, as quickly as you can within a proper range of motion. Lastly, we want to progressively decrease ground contact times. This comes in line with increasing your frequency, and if you're in a good postural position, you're probably gonna do this automatically, but this is something we still need to consider and something that has some training implications for fatigue management, plyometric training, and other things where we wanna both improve the fundamental capability to have short ground contact times, but also set up the workout in a way that is setting us up for success so we're not doing so much running that by the end of the workout, our ground contact times are are longer than they should be. The approximate goal for ground contact times in elite sprinters is 0.08 seconds, and the flight time is 0.12 seconds. So it's approximately 0.2 seconds per stride when you're running fast. Now this may vary, and you don't have to be exactly there, but this is sort of a guideline for seeing how fast are you getting on and off the ground and how fast are you flying through the air, and how does that match up with what the quote, supposed goal is for elite sprinters. Now you don't wanna just artificially reduce your ground contact time by pulling your thigh off the ground too soon because if your rate of force development capabilities are not very good, then you're not gonna go as far each stride if you pull your foot off the ground too soon. If you just tap, 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 you're not gonna go very far. So you need to balance the idea of short ground contact times with making sure that you're on the ground enough so that you produce a propulsive impulse which is going to send you through the air. A propulsive impulse is defined as how much force you put into the ground, as well as how much time for which that force is applied. So if you apply a certain amount of force, you also need a certain amount of time to apply it to then send you through the air. If your ground contact time is too short, your stride length is gonna get cut off and you're not gonna run as fast. You do wanna increase frequencies. 
you do want to decrease ground contact times, but not to the point that it is detrimental to your performance. The workout requirements for a speed workout can be outlined as such. You need to sprint between 30 and 60 meters so that you're running long enough to achieve maximal velocity, but you're not running so long that you're now working on speed endurance. To improve maximal velocity, we need to really just focus on hitting it, hanging out there for a little bit, and then shutting off. We don't want to be working on endurance. We don't want to be making ourselves tired throughout the workout. You want each rep to be high intensity. You want each rep to be fast and you don't want to be running when you get into the blocks or you get into your position and you're thinking, ah, oh, another one. Once you feel like that, you're probably not working on total maximal velocity. Maximal velocity is only achieved at a true 100% of output, and therefore we need to manage fatigue very carefully and we reduce the distances run accordingly. Similar to the distance we use, we're probably only going to do three to six runs at that maximal velocity or at that maximal intensity. If you can do more and you can maintain the speed, maybe you can do that. But for most people, three to six runs between 30 and 60 meters at 100% intensity is gonna be the limit. Once you're outside of six reps, you're probably not running very fast. If you're below three reps, you're probably not doing enough work to cause any change because it's not stressful enough for the body to think, hey, we need to respond to this. So you have to find that sweet spot which I think is somewhere between three to six reps of 30 to 60 meter runs. You need to use moderate to full recovery between these runs. As I'll go over in a second, you can do a capacity focused workout, but still be touching on speed. And that's something you're gonna do probably earlier in the year. But when you're really focusing on bringing up the actual velocity at which you can sprint, then the rest needs to be long enough so that you can fully recover between runs. Maybe sip on a little Gatorade and creatine in between just so that you're refueled and ready to go when you get in the blocks, get in your stance, and you run. Most sessions should run between 180 to 240 meters with 300 to 360 meters being the ultimate highest volume that you should ever use in a speed training workout. Once you're below 180 meters, it's probably not stressful enough to cause much of a change. If you're above 300 or above 360 meters, that's gonna be way too stressful and you're not gonna be able to come back and run very well within the next couple days. So you need to balance what you can do to cause change with what is not so much that it's impossible for you to recover from. We can break up workout variations into three categories. One is maximal velocity capacity. So this is where we're gonna do shorter runs, maybe 40 meter runs with short rest periods. An example could be two by three by 40 meters. So we're gonna do two sets of three reps of 40 meters with a walk back rest in between the repetitions and something like five, six, seven minutes between the sets. So each run you're doing within each set you have a little bit of fatigue, but you're still trying to get up to that high frequency, still trying to get up to maximal velocity, and then you shut it down, walk back, do it again. After you do, say, three of those reps or four of those reps, then you rest for longer, fully recover, and do another set. This is where you're gonna build the capacity to do speed work. So then eventually, once you have that capacity, you can now focus truly on hitting maximal velocity and not be getting fatigued because you don't have that basic base of speed training capacity. Then there is true maximal velocity sprinting. This is where you're probably gonna to wanna to spend most of your time at 40 meters or 50 meters using full recovery. This could be something like four by 40 meters. It could be three by 30 followed by three by 50. This could be four by flying 20s with a roll in or skip in or drop in start. Or it could be something like two by 30, two by 40, two by 50. But whatever you do, you wanna fully recover in between these reps because these are true maximal velocity workouts where we're trying to take the speed at which you can run and push it up, which is one of the hardest things to do in sports performance training. So to do that, you gotta be very certain that the amount that you're running, how long you're running for, and how much time you have to recover in between allows you to hit those highest levels of maximal velocity. Lastly, there's the maximal velocity and short speed endurance hybrid type workout. So this is where you might do four by 40 followed by a 60, or you might do two 30s, two 40s, and then an 80. The way you can incorporate these workouts is to start out with something like you sprint through 40, but then you just try to maintain that through 60, 70, or 80 meters. You're not really trying to go at 100% after that 40 meter mark, but you are trying to maintain your technique and maintain the speed that you're at. 
This can then progress over time to where maybe you are doing 60s all out, but because you've developed your speed over this previous period of time, now when you go through 60, you're spending most of that 40 to 50 or 55 meter segment at maximal velocity, and you only start decelerating and hitting short speed endurance at the end of that rep for, for a short duration of time. So you can blend in short speed endurance work with the speed work as a way to transition toward running a 60 in competition and feeling like you have the endurance and the capacity to make it through that run at full intensity. Or if you're trying to progress to outdoor, this is a great way to blend the speed qualities you're developing into short speed endurance, which is gonna help you in that 100 meter dash. Now when it comes to implementing speed work, Short sprinters, such as 60 meter runners, 100 meter runners, and 200 meter runners, they should be focusing on speed pretty much year round. If you're not, you're missing out on important opportunities to raise your performance level, and if you only spend a couple weeks out of the year, or even a couple months out of the year focusing on speed, that's maybe eight months, 10 months out of the year that you're not focusing on speed. And if you think that you're gonna become an elite sprinter by not focusing on speed work, then you are sadly mistaken. Considering this, you need to implement speed work year round. Now you should take some time off in the off season where you're not running at all. And also during the early preseason or really the early off season, that's where you're gonna wanna ease back in and not just show up day one and run as fast as you can. But over a short progression of time, you should be able to transition into speed work so that you're spending probably eight, nine, 10 months of the year with some aspect of speed work incorporated in your program. This can be done on grass. This can be done in shoes. This can be done on the track in spikes. You can vary it up so that at the point in the year that you're at, you're not doing something that's over the top, you're not doing something that's too soon, but you still are focusing on the qualities of maximal velocity throughout the year so that you're ensuring that you're focusing on the things that are most important for performance and not neglecting them in favor of other things that are less important for performance. Speed should be touched on two to three times per week, and this can be in the form of a dedicated speed day, or it can be as a part of a blended workout. So say one day you're gonna focus on some speed endurance, but you wanna start the workout off with some 40s so that you still touch on that maximal velocity, and then you go follow it up with a, a short speed endurance workout or a longer speed endurance workout. You might go three by 40, take some good recovery, and then go run two 120s. This can be a way to where you can blend in speed training with the speed endurance work so that depending on the point in the year that you're at, you are mixing things in a way that progresses toward your ultimate goal. Another thing is earlier in the year, maybe you're doing 30s because you're just kind of getting into it. Well, you could do a couple 30s, but then follow it up with a 50. So that way you're still getting some more upright sprinting, getting into that upright posture and hitting those higher frequencies, but only for a rep or two. So that way you're introducing these types of qualities to the athlete, but not just smashing them with it in the second week of training. If you're looking to truly develop speed, and by that I mean to increase the speed at which you can run, you're gonna to need to focus on speed training for at least four to eight weeks in a very consistent and repetitive manner. If not, you're probably not hitting it frequently enough and for not for long enough to cause the changes that you want. Alternatively, if you're looking to just maintain speed, then you need about one workout per week in your program to do that. Working in a way to attain a new level of speed that you've never run at before is a lot harder than it is to maintain the speed you currently run at. Therefore, if you're trying to actually develop speed, you need to have a very focused period of time where you're, that's the number one goal of training. And when you look at your training program, it's extremely obvious and clear that that's the goal of the program. So you have to be certain that you know what your goal is and then program in a way that targets that goal. Whether you're looking for speed or something else, that should always be the way that you're approaching your programming. Lastly, if you're looking to peak for competition, then you need to make sure that you're hitting speed in practice, but only to the point where you get up to that speed and then you shut it off. Instead of doing four by 40 leading up to a competition, maybe you do two, where the first one is sort of just, you know, getting into the swing of things after your warm up, making sure you're feeling good and that your body's healthy enough to run fast. Then you do that 140 or that 160 all out as fast as you can, shut it down and go home. That's how you can peak for competition while still maintaining the speed qualities, but not having workouts that are so stressful that you can't come back to the competition in a few days and run fast. You should probably set this last speed workout before a competition a few days before, so that way you're not entering the competition with something tight, feeling a little tired, or whatever. Some people might do really well with a fast sprint workout the day before a meet, but it has to be super low volume with like one maximal intensity run, and that's it. Or maybe it's at 95%. 
But that's something you'd have to decide for yourself uh, as being something that's appropriate because your ability to recover from that type of training will vary widely compared to anyone else out there. So guys, to recap, if you want to run faster and you actually want to increase the speed at which you can sprint, then your program needs to be very focused on speed. Speed can be achieved with workouts between 30 and 60 meters, probably no more than three to six reps, and you can vary it up using rest, duration, how you run throughout that rep as a way to target different things such as speed capacity, true maximal velocity, or a hybrid speed endurance and speed workout. If you're looking to develop speed, you need to have a very focused program over time with very consistent themes that promote speed. If you want to just maintain speed, you can hit it once a week and be good. If you're trying to peak for a competition and really run as fast as you can, then you need to hit speed in the week leading up to that competition, but not at any high volume. One rep, two reps, and that's it. So guys, I hope you appreciate this video. If you need speed training programs, I got them on my website. You can see a link down below. If you like this video, please hit a thumbs up as that's going to tell YouTube, hey guys, this video is good, show it to everybody, so that'll really help me out. If you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing so that way you can get all my future videos when they come out. Thank you guys for tuning in, I'll catch you next time.